All right. Let me. So when I do this, I'll make sure I'm doing it right. Do I want to? I want to join companion. Yeah. Mode? Okay. And I probably want to set my. Do not disturb. And I probably want to mute this so this doesn't make any noise. Um, and now to present, I just I do this and do a tab. Yeah, that works. There are a couple ways of doing it. Depends if you need your speaker notes or not. Like that? Yep. There's no audio. So I'm just gonna do that. Yeah. And then if you hit the slide show, that's uh, okay. Do you need your presenter notes? Um, yeah, how do I get that? Let me do that differently. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. Let's just do this step by step. Oh, I see. Presenter view. Oh, okay. So you can just. It just that. automatically goes right to it. There you go. And uh, it's it's somewhere you can find it. Yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna try to all it back and then delete everything. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um. Hmm. It was there. They're not there. They're not there. Uh, I did see them. <laughs> I don't know where they went though. Right. Okay, let's. We can we can just do this again because now we know it's going to be in the right. There you go. Okay, you're set up. Okay. Oops. There we go. Yes. Yeah. Well, that mic. That mic, not this mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's four oh five officially starts, so I'll wait I'll wait till then. People still filtering in. So there's a break, is there? Um I so the way I usually do this is that I have some buffer slides at the end. So when I get five from you, so I'm like, oh, not there yet. I'll just go. Yeah, I'm here for text call. But, yes, so, um, but yeah, you can. I mean, I, I got the timer in there too. So, I'm just going to answer questions. Did you get a I did, but that's okay. I don't, I don't need a cookie. Okay. I got water. Okay. Coffee. No, I I probably did use coffee. Really good. Really good. It's getting late in the day, isn't it? Four. Oh, five. Okay. There you go. We'll just feed you. Yeah. Just, just don't make us miss Jennifer Daniels. What? Just don't make us miss Jennifer Daniels. I've, I've been trying to read her abstract, but it's pretty difficult. Did, she, did we finally get her posted? No, I mean, it's the abstract is the emoji. Yes. Well, that's her title. That's her title. The title is the yeah, emoji. I don't think, she has to <clears throat> so I think you have to read between the lines. Yeah. <laughs> That's a serious camera. You better get a good close up. That's, yeah, that's good too. That's really good. I'm still. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm going to turn that off so we don't get extra noise. 
to start by that. And we have a few minutes still so before the official start time, so I'll I'll wait. You can talk amongst yourselves. If I let's see, it. it just stand back. It, it's okay. I don't need to put this guy on. Okay. I mean, I. <clears throat> Uh, sometimes I can have a very loud voice anyway, so <laughs> hopefully not blow anybody out here. That's <clears throat> right. Okay, there's my signal. I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, oh, wait. Did you get a signal from me? No, I got a signal from the clock that it's that it's 4.05. <laughs> um, <laughs> Could I wait for a signal from you? No, no, my, my phone buzzed, so I, and, and I saw they switched to 4.05. Um, it's... I believe it's already recording okay, as indicated there. So I think we're good to go. Uh, welcome to my talk. My name is Josh Hadley and um, I work at Adobe. I'm in the Adobe fonts uh, division. Um, we have a font service. We create our own fonts. Um, we have expertise in the field. I also participate in uh, the UTC subcommittee of properties and algorithms group, which uh, if you attended Marcus's talk a little bit earlier, I'm the vice chair of that group. I'm also involved industry in the, um, let me make sure I get the numbers right. It's ISO IEC 14496-22. <laughs> Everybody knows what that is, right? <laughs> Uh, which is the open font format, um, also known as, well, not also known as, but it is a parallel standard to the open type font format, which is the predominant font format um, that everyone uses these days. So I participate in um, uh, developing that standard and, um, and that kind of thing as part of an ad hoc group. Um, okay, so. That's me, and let's uh, talk about the title of the of this talk. Um, character and glyph uh, aren't they the same thing? Um, for some people, you uh, you may may only have heard of character, uh, but a, a, a lot of people kind of mistakenly refer to glyph interchangeably with character, and they're not the same thing. Um, in, in, in general terms, a glyph is a specific visual representation uh, typically defined in a font of a character. And the character is the smallest component of a written language that has semantic value, that has meaning. And it refers to the abstract meaning, not, not a specific shape, not a specific form. Um, and in Unicode circles, it's common to refer to characters by their code points. So for example, uh, the U plus notation indicates Unicode, not some other encoding scheme. Um, 0041, and that's hexadecimal, uh, is the character A. Okay, got it. So simple, every character has a glyph, right? No, no. Uh, some characters aren't meant to have a visual depiction and won't have a visible glyph. They may have a glyph slot defined in the font, but it won't be visible necessarily. Uh, in some cases, some multi-character sequences can be represented by a single glyph, and vice versa, some 
single characters might be represented by multiple glyphs. The point is, the relationship's not one to one to one, um, and it it might be uh, many to one. It might be one to many. It might be one to zero. It might be many to zero, uh, depending on the situation. <clears throat> So how do we get from a character to a glyph? So on the left side here, I've represented um, some string of uh, Unicode code points and a, a box with a question mark. And on the right side, I have some uh, visual depiction of that text. So how do we get there? What's inside the box? Well, actually, there's, there's several boxes. And font, you've probably heard of this one. I think, I hope most everyone here is familiar with, with where the font is, or at least has selected one from a font menu at one time. Uh, maybe you haven't if you're, if you're on a, a, a platform um, that uh, doesn't allow you to select the font, you're, you're still probably experiencing fonts <laughs> um, if you're reading text um, with your eyes. Um, now, uh, they're, uh, someone asked if there's a, a Braille font, and I, actually they're Braille uh, uh, codes defined, um, and you can print them, um, but really I think you need a Braille printer with the raised dots to make that actually readable by someone who can read with their fingers. All right, uh, one of the other boxes that you may not have heard of is, is known as the layout engine, and there's a Baidai engine and a shaping engine, and a font rasterizer. Other parts besides the font may be not as familiar with um, unless you're involved with a company that makes these sort of things. So let's talk about these other boxes. A layout engine is the thing that handles sort of very high level text layout on a page. Um, determines the groups of text that might belong to the same script, figures out where line breaking might happen, flowing text through columns, around images, and so on and so forth. And a layout engine can and should uh, take information from these following uh, parts of the um, Unicode standard and Unicode technical reports that I put up here. Uh, number 14 is the line breaking algorithm. Uh, 24 is uh, scripts, script properties. And 29 is the uh, grapheme cluster or generally segmentation, but it's word and, um, and other uh, boundaries. All right, uh, bidirectional text engine. Um, this, it doesn't always come into play um, with, uh, with, with some scripts, but um, when you have a mixture of scripts or some when you have only a single script such as Arabic that has, um, uh, digits or other things in there. It is actually bi-directional. I'll, I'll show more about that a little bit later in my talk. Um, but uh, again, uh, for the Unicode angle on this, this is UAX number nine, which defines the bi -di, Unicode bi -di algorithm. Sometimes you'll hear that referred to as the UBA. Um, and it's a whole a very, very, very complicated set of rules and, um, and guidelines for how to uh, order text and uh, so it's understood. The shaping engine, um, this is um, not necessarily defined by, um, by Unicode, but it can take a lot of guidance from Unicode properties and algorithms. Um, so basically what this does is interface, the, and, and I should say before, the, the, the other three boxes that I mentioned here, these are primarily dealing with just things at the character level. When we get to the shaping engine, this is sort of getting to the boundary between characters and glyphs. So this starts to look at the characters and the order that they're in, and it figured, and it looks at the font data and starts picking out which glyphs to use. So I'm giving a little hint to where this is going here. And um, it also can do some, a little bit of rearrangement. If you're in um, Sibu's talk just before this, we, 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 he kind of got into that a little bit. Um, and so this is the realm of the shaping engine. This is sort of right before we, uh, we 
display the text. And the font, we talked about that. Uh, font's basically just a data file, contains uh, glyph outlines, it contains very important a mapping of Unicode characters to glyphs within the font. It also contains glyph substitutions, glyph positioning information, various metrics, and a lot, lot more. And again, I'm, I'm going to be getting deeper into all these as we go. This is just sort of the first, first pass. And finally, the font rasterizer. This is probably the um, least complicated part, maybe. Uh, once we've figured out all the glyphs from the font based on the characters that we received, we uh, basically end up, the, 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 uh, the shaping engine's going to give us uh, an array of glyph IDs and a size. We hand that off to the font rasterizer with a starting position and say, draw these here. So I'm not going to actually talk about that too much. I think I have one more slide that um, gets into font rasterizer, but I'm not really going to uh, get too far into that one. Um, I, I do deal with fonts um, all day, and that's my expertise. So this is going to be very much focused on where the fonts come into play here. So let's take a closer look at fonts, shall we? OK. Um, I said before that a font's basically, it's a data file. It's a collection of tables. And um, this is a font tool that we use frequently to inspect fonts. And um, you see the, the second column there says tag. Uh, we refer to the tables within the font as uh, with these four character tags. So there's a base table. And you can see in the comment what, what each one does defines the baseline data table, dsig, gdef, uh, glyph definition table, gpause, glyph positioning table, gsub, glyph substitution, and so on and so forth. And so for example, here's a, a part of a name table in the font. Uh, the name table stores various strings that identify the font in various places. You may not ever see some of these strings, but if you look at a font menu, you're going to see uh, the, these are where those are stored in a font. And along with, like, you can see this one. So the top level, the, uh, the one that has a one next to it, um, in the line number 30 there, source sans three, that's the main thing you would see in a font menu. And then the style, the one right below it is regular. Um, the font also stores uh, vertical metrics. Um, this is sort of maxima and minima of um, characters and the tallest and lowest character in the font. It just stores information about um, uh, what those values are. And that assists in laying out the text on the page. If you have multiple lines, this aids in establishing where the lines are positioned. Okay, CMAP, this is a very, very important table. Here's character and glyph. Uh, CMAP is character to glyph mapping table. And um, this is basically uh, on the, you know, I see uh, circled here, the code. And in this case, that is the Unicode value. It associates each code with a specific glyph in the font. And a glyph ID is just a number of, uh, it's a sequence of outlines and shapes and things like that. I'll talk about this, I think, next slide. Okay, uh, yeah, so glyph image. So there are actually a couple different t tables in the font that can store glyph image. But just know that um, the, the basic idea is it stores a series of uh, coordinates which define uh, line segments and curve segments, and the, w which we call an outline. And uh, that that is the glyph. So if you see back here in the CMAP, I have 0021, which is the code for exclamation mark, and that's glyph ID 1392. And you can see right there, that is what glyph 1392 looks like. That's the, the outline for exclaim, exclamation mark. Uh, so here's where I take a, just a very brief detour and talk about the font rasterizer. Um, so what the font rasterizer does is it actually takes the font outline, scales it up or down depending on the point size that you've selected, and fills it in with pixels uh, as best it can. So this is an enlarged view 
of uh, of, a, of of what it looks like if you to take a magnifying glass and look at a, you know normal line of text on your screen and look at your screen with that, you would see something like this. Um, you may see something a little different than this, but uh, if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see, oh yeah, that's a smoothed out exclamation mark. All right, uh, back, to, back to font tables. Um, I mentioned before the glyph substitution table. Um, this is basically a, 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 a collection of what we call lookups. And lookups take a um, list of inputs and generate outputs from that. And this is where we get into the one to many, many to one, so on and so forth. What I have highlighted here is, is a ligature. And a ligature glyph is um, basically a composition of multiple inputs. And in this case, the, the one I have highlighted here is FFT. Um, so for uh, in 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 uh, Latin script, um, things involving F in a proportional typeface, uh, the curvy top of the F when it's next to another character that's also tall, like another F or a T, um, it can collide and look really kind of ugly. So we often, when we have the uh, uh, when when the design guides us to do it we will draw a separate FFT with the, with the overhang a little bit shortened or maybe connected in a more visually pleasing way. Um, and, but this is not the only writing system that this has done. It's actually um, much more common in, in, in lots of writing systems, but uh, this is just kind of a quick one that I hide. And so this, uh, th this, the, the gibberish that you see here basically means, and you can kind of see this, uh, it's, it's backwards, but the uh, FFT and the left arrow, F underbar, F underbar T, that's the name of the resulting ligature. So that rule means when you see FFT in sequence, substitute with the FFT ligature. Okay, uh, more about the guts of fonts. Um, the, there's another table called the glyph positioning or GPOS table. And uh, what I'm showing here is one example of glyph positioning is mark placement. So when we have a character sequence that is a base glyph followed by a combining mark, there's rules in the font that say, here's how to position this vertically and horizontally, this combination, this pair, uh, to get a, uh, a visually pleasing result. Okay, uh, so that was a, a, a somewhat of a deep dive on fonts and oh, are you going through this very quickly. Um, so let's look at a, a little bit at the other parts. Um, and again, I, 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 my, my expertise is in fonts and it, I, I have a, a fair amount of knowledge about these other things, but I'm not gonna go quite as deep into these. Um, I talked about earlier the, the layout engine. One, one thing it can do is group things by script and it can take information from Unicode standard. Uh, this is a scripts.txt file and this, uh, basically lists out um, the, the character codes and which script they belong to. So a shaping engine could use that information to analyze a, a batch of incoming text on a page and say, oh, okay, from here to here, that's, uh, that's Greek, and from here to here, that's Arabic, and so on and so forth to just get a, 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 an idea of where the script groupings are because that'll come in handy later. Um, another thing it can do is, uh, again, using uh, UX29, um, is determine where word breaks are. And again, what happens here is it's not actually going to do anything except identify for later on, for future reference, if you need to put a break somewhere, here are some places that you could do that. So it's basically opportunities for where to put word breaks, line breaks, and sentence breaks. And again, this is all um, in, a, in a good layout engine. It should be based on Unicode rules. Uh, not all layout engines um, use Unicode rules, but um, they should. 
So if you write a Unicode, or if you write a layout engine, please use Unicode rules. Okay, um, I, I mentioned earlier the the, the Bidai engine, and um, this is <laughs> a, a, just just to scare you. Um, and I, I said this before, and I wasn't lying. The 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 bidirectional algorithm is pretty complicated, um, and there there are some implementations of it, um, but not very many. And I think that speaks to uh, how complicated it is. Um, but this, uh, so we have uh, util.unicode.org, and you can go into this. Um, a sort of playground for for uh, bidirectional text, and you can enter your own text and um, see how the bidi algorithm acts on it. Um, in the um, in the upper part of the lower portion there, um, you can see what the memory position of each character is, and then after the bidi algorithm acts on it, you can see what the resulting um, order is. And uh, just here's here's a an example. And um, again, uh, my so my experience with fonts. I've I've been working with fonts since uh, well, it's actually been about thirty years. I started in 1993 out of college, um, and um, I am not an expert in any script really, other than possibly Latin, although I'm not even sure of that. Um, but I, I, I've developed a fairly broad, uh, but not very deep uh, experience. Um, so if I, if any of my exa examples I'm wrong, um, you can yell at me, but uh, try not to get too mad at me. Um, so uh, this is just a, a one, one uh, very, this is a rather, rather simple example of, of the Vida algorithm acting. Um, you can see on the, um, in the far left is the character input sequence. And so this is seen lam alef meme space two zero two three. Um, but if you look at what we get when the Vidai algorithm is applied, uh, first of all, it's predominantly right to left. So we start at the right edge, and there's the scene, the lam alef meme space, but the, the 2023 within that is still read left to right. Um, so this is, this is uh, part of what the Baidai engine does is helps you uh, position this correctly. And this is, this is how if, uh, if you were writing Salam 2023 um, in some text, this is the correct way to display that. Okay, uh, let's move on to the shaping engine. So this is sort of, it, it, the, the, the three things here, um, these, these sort of work in, in this sequence, but um, they may kind of do a little bit of cyclical stuff because the result, particularly the shaping engine, might change a position or something like that. So you may, might need to reevaluate uh, where where break is or something like that. So, um, but the this is sort of the next thing in the sequence. It will the shaping engine. Uh, this is where we start again to cross that boundary between character input and what's in the font, the glyphs, and and getting them up to the screen. Um, so this is going to take the results of the layout and bidi engines and resolve characters, two glyphs, again, using the font data, the CMAP data that I showed, and that's just sort of the entry point. Um, it, it, that's a, a first level mapping of character to glyph. Then we get into the G sub table, which I talked about before with the F, F, and T. So that's gonna change the first level of character to glyph into maybe some other glyphs. And then we're gonna maybe depending on what the text is, position those glyphs. So it all, like I said, the, 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 the entry point is really sort of the CMAP, but um, a lot can change from there, depending on uh, what, the, what the text is and what the font developer has decided to put into the font. 
And again, I, I mentioned this, I might need to kind of iterate a little bit on this, uh, but once the shaping engines has sort of figured out, okay, here's all my character input, here's how my, I'm gonna shape them, here's how I'm gonna position everything, takes that result, which is an array of glyph IDs and positioning information, shovels that off to the font rasterizer and the font rasterizer takes its outlines, fills in the characters like I showed you before with the little simple example of the exclamation mark and then you have text on your screen. Simple as that. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd say, I'd say putting it all together, but um, I'm kind of fudging a little bit because this is, this is mostly going to be um, the last three. There's a little bit with the by day engine in this example, um, not much with the layout engine because in, my, in the examples I'm going to show you, they're primarily single lines of text, um, but just know that um, the layout engine is part of putting text on a page in a word processing application in your web browser when you view a web page in a uh, page design application. Okay, so um, if, if, if there are readers of Arabic in here, okay. <laughs> um, you'll immediately recognize this as wrong. Uh, yes, uh, wrong in so many ways, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, what I what I want you to pay attention to again is this the the uh, second and third columns from the left, um, and you can pay attention to the first one too. It's just very hard to see. Um, but the Unicode and Unicode name that's our character character input sequence. And as I go through how the byte algorithm and shaping engine work on that input text, you're, what you're, you're going to notice or what you're not going to notice, it, it doesn't change. Okay, So the, the character sequence is always the same, but the glyphs will change depending on um, what what the shaping engine done. So, uh, and just just a little brief aside here. This is a, a tool that um, font developers, people who work with fonts, um, will find extremely handy. I use this pretty much every day. Uh, it's called Font Goggles. Um, it only runs on Mac OS, so sorry if your Windows are out of luck or, or other uh, non-Mac. Um, but if, if you do any work with fonts that you need to kind of see what's going on under the hood, this is an excellent tool. Um, I've contributed to some of the underlying projects that, that went into this. This is a collection of many different um, libraries and, and other tools that um, I think actually was funded by Google Fonts and uh, came up with this great thing. But what it allows us to do is uh, obviously Put, make some input text on a single line, and this uh, this bit over here um, on the on the right panel, you can see the sort of red boxes. Those are uh, what we call features, uh, font features, and those are again defined in the uh, glyph substitution and and uh, glyph positioning tables. And um, normally, um, the, the users rarely get to the level where they're selecting these. Um, maybe some of the uh, high-end um, page layout applications will, will let you select certain things. But for basic text, um, it particularly uh, complex text with, with such as Arabic and the index script and so on, uh, they don't really even let you select these. But this tool does because it's useful for uh, sort of seeing how shaping actually works. And um, all right, I'm going to go to next slide where I start the process. So now, okay, at least we have the, the, the visual order right, but this is still wrong. This is still very, very wrong. But again, notice the first column didn't change. We're, we're still acting on the same input text, right? Now we're just rearranged in, in the right order. This is right to left. 
And now I'm going to switch on the initial forms. And I've highlighted, and I'm going to toggle back and forth here. Uh, this is the meme. So it's the, it's the first in the left column. It's on the right. So Arabic, when you, when, uh, when you write Arabic, it's a join script. Um, each character may have up to four different visual forms. When, and it depends on whether they're isolated form, standing alone, whether they're at the beginning of the word, such as this example, the meme, uh, or whether they're in the middle of the word or whether at the end of the word. So basically, this is what I've yeah, kind of given you a preview of what I'm going to do here. Um, I'm going to step through these. Um, again, this is with no shaping. So it's turning initial forms on, turning medial forms on. So we're getting there. We're getting there. But it's still wrong. And hey, this should look right. Am I right? <laughs> okay. So again, I just do, I, um, I kind of purposely arranged these so I could do some little animation here. But this is, this is shaping. This is the shaping engine happening right before your very eyes. And so this is what we end up with. And again, the character sequence does not change. It's all driven by the shaping engine. OK? So that's, that's kind of neat. Oh, uh, one thing else I wanted to highlight here. Um, I, I talked about a little bit about ligatures. And um, I, this is Adobe Arabic. I, I didn't even realize this was uh, available in the font. But um, we have a lamb meme uh, ligature um, at the end here. So this is two characters, but one glyph. OK. And here's the same string uh, rendered in several different Arabic fonts. So that's pretty cool. Again, um, if, you, if you work with fonts and you're, you have a Mac, uh, get this tool. It's free. Font Goggles. I think it's fontgoggles.org. Um, it's super handy and really a lot of fun to play with um, if, you, uh, if you have to deal with fonts at all. OK, uh, so here's another example of putting all or most of it together. Um, and this is an indic shaping example. So um, here's some very wrong Hindi text. Um, now, this is supposed to say, uh, and, and I, so I don't actually speak Hindi, but um, I've, I've gotten some help from outside friends. I believe this is supposed to say, Namaste Dunya which is hello world. Um, Hindi speakers who care to correct me? Yes, that's, that's good. OK, good. good. OK, but um, so I, I might have had the, the pronunciation more or less correct, but the rendering here is, is very wrong. Um, and again, as with the last uh, example, watch the left side. It does not change, but when I apply shaping uh, the 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 visual display changes and what I wanted to highlight here is a, a feature of uh, De Devanagari script and um, what the shaping engine does so this um, the I vowel here switches away well, I guess I kind of obliterated it here but um, you can you can see in my animation. So even though the character order is the, in the dun, dunya, uh, after the na is the i, that's the one with the big hook on it. So that's the character order. But the actual visual order, when you write this word, these words in Hindi, uh, i vowel goes ahead of the consonant that it's associated with. And, uh, Hopefully, I've visually indicated that enough here. Um, and let's see. Uh, one other thing I'm, I'm just going to talk about is um, further to the left in the, in the first word. Um, and I'm, I'll toggle my animation, and maybe you can see what else is going on. Anybody, anybody want to comment what it is? 
Okay, position, yes, but what else? Okay, yeah. This last, I can't tell if it's two characters or two characters plus a diacritic are combining into what looks like one glyph. That's exactly right. Um, and 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 this is something that's actually can be font dependent, but the um, uh, uh, the sa, which is in this example, um, the one that has the mark below it, and that mark is a virama. Uh, so when you when you have a consonant followed by a virama in 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 Devanagari and many uh, of the other Indic scripts. All the consonants have an inherent short vowel, short a vowel sign. So, na, ma, sa, but we're going to cancel that because we're only saying the s part of that. So, this is the character order. It is sa followed by virama, and then what happens in this font when you have that sequence is that sa converts to what's called its half form, and you can kind of see that here. Uh, basically, the vertical stem goes away, and also the virama itself goes away. And so we end up with this half form. And in this font, it's actually a, a combined glyph with the next glyph, uh, which is the ta. So that's a, a ta ligature glyph. And then it has the e sign, which is the hook above on the end. So... That's kind of neat. Not all fonts do this. Some some fonts might make a vertical ligature of those two uh, characters, um, and some will still make a half form. Uh, I think that part is required, but it might be a separate glyph from the top. I, I'm not exactly sure why it was made a separate glyph in this case, but um, different fonts can do that. That's kind of one of the one of the cool things about fonts is we can make ligatures where we want to. <laughs> Okay, and let's see, how am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay. Well, I will, this, was, this one's quick, so I'll just quickly go through. So this is Thai, and um, I, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't verify this with a Thai reader, but I copied it from text that was written by a Thai native speaker. And what I, what I understand is, is this phrase says, these also contradict each other. Um, if you read Thai, maybe you can verify that. Um, anyway, this is um, wrong, again. Um, it's not quite as wrong as the other examples, but if you look, um, let's see, one, two, three, four, about five characters over, you can see that just massive blob of marks. Um, it doesn't look very good, and um, that's not what we want to show our readers. We want to show them a nice visual depiction. So uh, this is getting into uh, glyph positioning, another bit of table data that's inside of a font. And there's two, two features at work here. One is mark positioning, which is how to position marks over base glyphs. And we also have mark to mark positionings, and that's how to position marks relative to other marks. So I'm going to turn this on. So there's, with mark positioning on, actually that's kind of worse. <laughs> but it just shows the need for all of this information in a font. And then here is with mark to mark positioning on, and we have very lovely looking Thai text. Okay, I think that's at the end of my show. Um, if you leave with no other useful information, Character is not glyph. Uh, the relationship is not one-to-one. -one. I'll end there. If people want to uh, ask me questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Any questions? Other than... Other than uh, font goggles, um, what other tools do you use to inspect the font? For example, uh, the, you know, what program do you use to uh, figure out the accent and descent and all that, um, you know, metrics of the font uh, that I can use? Uh, that would be very useful for me. Okay, um, so 
part of my work at Adobe um, is working on open source and other in-house font tools. Uh, the one that I showed, and I, th I think you're referring to, uh, sorry for the whiplash, were you, were you talking about that one? Yeah. Okay, um, yes, this is from an open source uh, collection of scripts that work with a tool called DrawBot. Uh, DrawBot is a Python-based tool that, um, as the name implies, can do all sorts of drawing, not just not just fonts, but um, shapes and gradients and other stuff like that. Um, it, but it can also draw fonts. And uh, our team developed, uh, we, we had in, 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 in private um, work a ton of different scripts that worked with this tool that we use for making our own fonts, proofing them, checking this sort of information. Uh, but we decided, hey, you know what? Uh, these might be useful for other font developers. So we uh, published this collection of scripts. Um, and I, I, sorry, I don't have the link handy, but um, it's uh, if you on your GitHub, it's uh, Adobe dash type dash tools, and this collection of scripts is uh, Drawbot scripts, D R A W B O T scripts. Thank you. Thank you. Spell that. Okay. Great. Other questions? Complaints? Oh, we're out of time. Sorry. <laughs> uh, my question is more about local GM, so it might not apply directly to you, but um, at Gap Inc., we translate um, marketing materials uh, written in Adobe applications and then like when we translate sometimes the question is uh, when one font is used in English which font we should use in Chinese so like are they uh, are there any mappings recommendations um there there probably are <laughs> um, that that's that's probably something more that a a design team would would want to be suggesting. So, for example, at Adobe, we have a whole collection of fonts called, called which uh, internally we call Adobe Clean. That's our branding font, and we have um, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, all in a harmonized style with the the Latin, and we also are that that's a Latin, Greek, Cyrillic, and we're developing some other writing systems all in this sort of harmonious design system, type design system. Um, but that's the guidance on that comes from our our branding design team, um, our font design, our font developers um, all provide input into how to make this all work correctly. There, there's lots of sort of style guides though for um, if, if you don't have your own branding collection of fonts. Uh, for what what things sort of pair well together, um, I can probably talk to you maybe more offline about about that. Um, but it, it that's really sort of a more of a like graphic design level decision, I would say. Yeah, I'm I'm font technology guy, so I mean, it's like you know I I can I can do an okay job of putting things together, but it's not my expertise. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a bunch, everybody. Uh, let's see. Where, where's a Googler? Should, should I stop the recording? Yeah, stop it. Stop it, and then...